All right. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the CVMA's weekly town hall for the fourth week uh, navigating in, through COVID-19. And my name is Melanie Hicks, and I'm the president of the CVMA and the moderator of these sessions. I'd like to take a moment to thank Hills Pet Nutrition for generously sponsoring this town hall series. I'm joined by our host, Dr. Scott Weiss, who is a professor at the Ontario Veterinary College and the director of the University of Guelph Center for Public Health and Zoonoses and Chief of Infection Control at the Ontario Veterinary College Teaching Hospital. So before we begin, I just want to ensure that everyone knows that this session is being recorded and the sessions will be shared on our website. So if you happen to miss one of the previous sessions, you can certainly go to our website to um, pick up on that uh, recording. We've also muted all of the participants to ensure the best audio experience. Um, I'd encourage you to keep your chat boxes open. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen just uh, where you can click and uh, we would love to have any questions and comments uh, throughout this session. If we don't happen to get to some of the questions, which did occur last week, uh, we are picking them up today and making sure that they are answered. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat box throughout and we'll, we'll pause to take those questions uh, from the chat box. Just make sure that you send it to everyone instead of a specific person. So um, before we just begin, I just wanted to um, talk about a couple of questions that were more directed at uh, the CVMA and CAHI last week um, before Scott begins. Um, the first question was, are, is there any chance that the CVMA can put out a survey to its members to know what protocol they would like sales reps to follow? This could be done rapidly as some provinces are returning to work. Um, so essentially the CVMA is in the final process of drafting a survey. It is covering a number of different uh, COVID-19 topics uh, and after last week's session we're going to incorporate questions examining your views on how uh, you want the relationship to evolve in this new norm. The second question uh, was, I'm surprised at all the planning for bringing refs back into the clinics. Wouldn't the default plan be for anyone who can continue to function remotely to keep doing this? Can Dr. F explain why reps can't continue to work from home for some time to come? Um, so Dr. F is uh, Dr. Kaleski uh, from CAHI or the Canadian Animal Health Institute and I did speak with her uh, and you're correct in that anyone who uh, can continue to support best vet hospitals remotely uh, can continue to do so particularly for those non-essential services and that that's something you can certainly discuss uh, with your reps. The phased approach that was outlined by the Canadian Health Animal Health Institute is more of a long-term overview of what can occur as provinces start to loosen regulations over the coming months if all is going well. So the purpose of the guidelines uh, for industry representatives is to ensure your safety as well as theirs and to minimize the risk during any kind of interactions. But ultimately the decision on how and when any kind of communication will take place, um, the, the final decision still rests with the veterinary hospital. So you can certainly um, talk to any of your reps uh, about this and, and uh, um, devise a plan. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Scott. Great. Let's see if we can get our screen shared. Great one. All right. Thanks for everyone coming out again. Pretty straightforward this time. I guess similar to what we've talked about before. Um, I guess get started. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, if it's urgent, but urgent, the title to chase me a little bit quicker, but never be afraid to ask. So the plan for today is just a little bit of an update on what's happened from the animal front. There have been a few developments over the last few days. Um, some of these are kind of more relevant than others, but some are going to cause some attention to the press. And it's good just for you to be aware of what's out there. And then the rest we're going to focus on Q&A. So a couple of the leftover questions from last time, as well as some other questions that have come in and any questions that come in through the chat box. So again, if you have any questions, I'm just going to get the chat box open for me. So feel free to send them through and we'll try to cover as many as we can. Uh, I won't spend much time on this, pretty much the same as last time, just the update on human cases, up about 8,000 from last week in Canada, diagnosed cases, obviously we're under diagnosing it. And the take home for that is, well, the case continues to come up slowly, we'll see what happens if things open up. We still have the vast majority of our population is susceptible. Even if we have 100 cases for every diagnosed case, we're still in the 20-ish percent range of people that have immunity if you get protective immunity long-term consistently after exposure, after infection, which we don't know is the case. So again, this is why we're doing this. And this is why we're thinking about needing to do this for months to year or beyond 
until effective treatments or effective vaccinations become widely available. So what's new in the animal world? Well, there have been a few things, uh, mainly out of Europe. So <clears throat> talked before about mink. There were initially two mink farms in the Netherlands that had cases and we're now up to five mink farms. And uh, the, the general story there is assumed to be human origin infection, because this is a human bug, ultimately. Uh, not really clear how many animals affected, how much spread was happening, but presumably some mink to mink transmission. They talked about illnesses and they talked about deaths with severe disease, more common in pregnant mink. Um, not very surprising. An interesting component here, again, which isn't very surprising, is identifying three seropositive cats from those farms. Uh, no word on whether those cats were interacting with people at all, but it seems quite plausible that this would be mink to cat, probably in mink feces. So mink, you, they're pretty nasty little critters in these cages usually. The cats aren't going to have close contact with them, but the cages are just suspended with, with feces running down below them catching it. So the cats could have good environmental exposure. So this needs to be clarified a little bit more, but this raises questions about interspecies spread, which is one of the reasons we're paying attention to animals. Even though it might be a, a, a small component, we want to make sure that we don't get spread from humans to animals and other domestic species or into wildlife. We don't want to create a reservoir or other transmission sources. Um, another case of dog in the Netherlands, not very surprising. Human owner was infected. Uh, dog was seropositive. It had severe respiratory disease and was euthanized, but it was unclear whether this was related to COVID. And most likely it wasn't. We're still at this point under the assumption that dogs don't get clinical disease or it's quite rare. They can get infected. They can be PCR positive, they can be virus and respiratory secretions, but they seem relatively or quite refractory to disease. As opposed to cats, which are more likely to get sick. A couple more cats identified in COVID positive households in Europe. One of these had a respiratory disease and one of these was healthy. So again, showing that I think probably a reasonable percentage of cats that get exposed, that get infected, don't get clinical signs, which is relevant for us because if we have an animal coming from a positive household or a high-risk household, we can't assume that they're not infectious if they're clinically normal. So clinically normal cats could be infected. Clinically normal dogs could be as well. It's probably less likely than cats. And if we're going to see disease, though, it's more likely you're going to be in a cat or a ferret. And that, it's that combination of respiratory disease plus or minus gastrointestinal disease that we're looking for. And common things occur commonly, right? Your, your run-of-the-mill respiratory disease in a cat is probably a normal respiratory pathogen, but it's doing that risk assessment. So if this is an adult cat in a household that doesn't have exposure to other cats, and it's got an acute onset of a, what looks like viral upper respiratory tract disease, and their owners are infected or might be infected, then you know, COVID has to be fairly high on your list there. Two papers, these are cases or situations that we've talked about before because information was released earlier, but these are the publications. If anyone's interested, uh, one of them is a review of the dogs from Hong Kong. The two owner, infected owner dogs were positive in Hong Kong. It just gives the whole timeline and explains a little bit more. It's available in nature. We also have these on, in our Worms and Germs blog website linked to that. So review of the cases from Hong Kong and dogs as well as a, a small and pretty unremarkable actually experimental study in cats where they infected three cats and then shot, saw that those cats could infect other cats. So pretty unsurprising, but it shows that you can get shedding of the virus for you know a few days, maybe up to a week. And again, showing that cats can infect other cats. So that you know, if a cat can infect another cat, it would make sense that a cat could infect a person because it's the same virus. If we have close contact with respiratory secretions, we need to be aware of that. Now, what just hit last night that's going to cause a bit of a stink, um, it follows up with the mink. So this information is not all that clear. It's coming out of the Netherlands about suspected mink to human transmission. Now, we've assumed that this is initially human to mink because that's how it's going to start with the human virus and then mink to mink transmission. And now there's a report from the, the Dutch uh, agriculture minister that uh, human infection from the mink was suspected. Now. If you look at the Reuters report from today, it said that they said it was from, there was a person who was infected from mink. You know, my Google Translate version of a report from, from the Netherlands from last night said it was plausible. So it's not really clear. I think various people are trying to find more information on how it happened. So how much, it's very, one of the problems we have by identifying animals as a cause, it's really difficult. When you've got a virus that's being spread widely in the human population, it's hard to figure out an animal source because if you've got a worker on this farm and they've got this virus, well, if someone else infected them or infected the mink, 
did they get it from the mink or did they get it from the person? And it's obviously in the community there. So teasing those things out, genomics are being used. And it sounds like the person and the mink had the same virus or a very similar virus. And there must be some reason they think that person wasn't exposed elsewhere. Uh, so this, this is a situation where we, we need more information, but it does raise concern of what we've been saying all the way along, right? It's gonna be a rare event probably, but if we spill it into animals, it might spill back into us, and that's why we don't want to spill it into animals. You might see a little bit of the news about that. Another thing that's kind of hitting the news a lot lately is, in, is dog parks being opened up. And Toronto just put this out the other day, uh, off-leash dog areas are being opened up, which I was a bit surprised at that, because um, they've got a bit, bit of mixed messaging in some cities. So various guidances say, keep your animal away from other people, and that's the whole concept of social distancing at the household level. You know, my talking point on this is, you know, you don't social distance as a person, you do it as a unit. So for me, social distancing includes, you know, if I social distance, my kids and my wife don't, we're not social distancing. So it's a household event, it's me and my wife and my kids and my animals. So if any of those break social distancing, we create risk for everyone else. So that's why we say keep your animals away from other people or other animals, because we just don't want to create the risk. The odds of a dog getting exposed to this virus leash are very low but you know if you wouldn't go shake someone's hand or give them a hug do you want your dog going over there and licking their hands and getting touched and then coming over and rubbing its face against your face well probably not so the messaging that we have out there for for off leash at least for me and we consistent with cdc messaging is keep your animals away from other animals and going to parks is great going to off leash parks if you can keep your animal away from other animals sure the problem with letting animals off leash is that brings people together too. Because, you know, your dog's off leash and it runs up and encounters another dog or another person and you go out to retrieve it, you end up chatting, you end up getting that, you know, six foot barrier broken. Um, it's just an ad from Toronto on the right. I guess they've never seen a, a Shih Tzu if they say three dogs is six feet. But, you know, it's a good graphic to rem remind people to stay away. So you might get clients asking about this because there is a lot of question about it. And still, the risk is going to be really low for an animal to encounter this virus, but we can do basic things to prevent that. And if I wouldn't let my kid go up and interact with someone, you know, might as well not let my dog go up and do the same thing, at least at this phase in the outbreak. Another similar area where a lot of questions come up is dog walkers, commercial dog walkers. And so the commercial dog walkers, they're, they're coming out with guidance on how to handle this and reduce the risk. And it, it's, it's the same general concepts, right? It's social distancing, is minimizing the number of contacts, the closeness of the contacts, the duration of the contacts, and bringing in some hygiene steps. So, you know, the more someone encounters someone else, the more animals encounter someone else, the more the risk goes up. And that's inherently there. If someone needs to have a dog walker take their dog, it's a matter of communicating with them. So for me, it's a matter of dog walkers being aware of their health status. So if the dog walker is doing a good job, they'll make sure that they're healthy before they visit a household. They'll confirm that the people of the household are healthy before Read that? No, oh, maybe not. Am I back? Okay, I'm on, I, was, I was muted there somehow. Okay, uh, let's get the screen sharing set up again. I'm not sure when you lost me, but okay. I was talking about dog walking. Hopefully everyone got there. Are we good to go? Can you hear me? Melanie, you can yes. give me a wave if you can hear me. Okay, okay, perfect. Just make sure we're back on track. 
so it's basically finishing up with dog walking. It's common sense. It's moving into normal procedures. So we need to just choreograph that a little bit, looking at health status and some basic kind of control measures. Uh, getting into some of the things we need to be thinking about in the long term. Okay, so I mentioned this before, and we've addressed this in the OVMA document that was released in a week or so ago. It's thinking about our clinics and thinking about how we maintain distancing. Uh, reception areas are a big one. So if you haven't done this yet, you need to be thinking about how your reception area is going to be run once you're in a situation where people start coming in. Ideally, we're still gonna keep people out as much as possible, but ultimately we're gonna get them in. Um, and like basically, if you gotta go into your reception area, figure out how many people can stay six feet apart from each other without having to do a little dance, right? You don't have to have a choreograph, so five people have to move in a certain, per, certain manner for someone to be able to get out the door. But how many people can realistically be in there and stay six feet away from each other and from your staff and think about how they're moving to get food and how they move to get prescriptions and everything else. And it really brings up the comment, like, should we actually be thinking about these as waiting rooms or they should be flow through rooms, drop off recovery type rooms. So it, it's gonna take some rethinking. And this isn't just for us, this is across all kinds of similar professions. And one of the take, I'm gonna bring it, actually I think the next slides here. So on the medical side and the dental side, they've got very similar issues and they're taking very similar approaches, which I think lets us look at what they're doing. But it also makes us realize that, you know, people aren't gonna think this is a strange thing. If we're changing how waiting rooms are done, we're changing where they have to stand, where, if they can come in. You know, it's not that it's weird I'm going to my vet and they're doing this. Well, I'm doing this to my vet and my dentist and my physiotherapist and my doctor. And it might actually be the opposite. Why am I doing this to my doctor and my physiotherapist and my dentist, but my vet's just doing it like normal. So I think we've got the ability to bring in these changes without worrying about people, how they're going to react to it because everyone's adapting to a new normal. So if you look at some of the Ministry of Health guidance in Ontario for physicians, it's the same stuff we've been talking about. So it's maximizing telemedicine. So here's an example of, you know, sc do initial screening by telemedicine, and then you can do a brief follow-up physical assessment if required. Minimizing the need for patients in the waiting room based on how you schedule things. Uh, talks about reducing number of exam rooms, which becomes an issue, obviously, with, with you know, maintaining the number of cases. Minimizing staff in the clinic, and we've talked about that too. People that can do certain duties, whether it's follow-up calls or administrative work from home, scheduling from home. The fewer people in the clinic, the fewer contacts we have and as we're doing more things to provide space, you know, our, our clinics just shrunk, essentially, just like restaurants just shrunk. And, you know, as we have to have more space between people, it means functionally we can get fewer people in there. So the more things we can do to move people out, the better. Just an example, another same thing for dentistry, basically. This is from a couple days ago. And the concept, you know, the, the comment at the top, I think, is good. The notion of sitting in the waiting room these days is largely done. And that's going to be like that for a while. You're not going to, you know, I think my dentist's office, they can fit you know, 10 or so people in the waiting area that's maybe, you know, 12 feet by 14 feet or something. It's not that big. So they can only really fit a couple. So you don't want to have area where it's designed to be in a place that you wait for a while. It's a place you flow through. Uh, similar things, they've cut back on in-person things. They do free screenings by phone. And the bottom one there, to maintain social distancing, dentists are having to rethink what they do. It's a reduction. Some have removed chairs from waiting room. It's changed how we think about how staff and patients flow through an office. Exact same thing we've been talking about. I'm saying this again, is just be thinking because we are in this for multiple months or beyond, it's good to be planning it now to make those transitions easier. And the other thing is just to realize that, you know, I don't think we're gonna have issue, well, we'll have issue some clients, but yeah, I don't think we're gonna have major issues that vets are doing something weird. Like that's not the way it's gonna be. It's gonna be vets are doing the strange stuff that everyone else is doing and it's gonna be normal. And I think it's gonna look abnormal if we don't do some of these things. Um, because you know, social expectation is going to be out there. I think mask use is another one. I think there's going to be a social expectation for fairly common mask use. So even though you know a month ago you might have felt weird wearing a mask in public, in three months you might feel weird not wearing one. Yeah, who knows what will happen with that, but I think these are the societal changes that we're going to see, and we should take advantage of them. Okay, this is a question from last time. This brings up some, some ideas of risk assessment. So this is a, a client takes their dogs to the U.S. for chemo, she isolates when she comes back for 14 days, but members of her household bring the dog uh, in. Is that a problem? And really, well, I guess the direct answer for me for that question is no. Like this person poses very little risk, right? They drive across the border, they go to the vets, they probably do a curbside drop off, hang out in their car, they drive back, and then they lock themselves in their house for two weeks. This might be your lowest risk client that you run into. 
So I mean, we're worried about people that self-isolate, but if people are self-isolated over an abundance of caution, their risk is really low. And then their contacts, their risk should be you know, even lower. So a contact of a contact of a contact, that risk starts dropping and dropping. So just because they're self-isolating doesn't mean they're necessarily at higher risk, but you need to understand why they're self-isolating. So if someone's self-isolating because they've had very close and prolonged contact with an infected person, okay, they are quite high risk of being infected. So I'm gonna be a little more concerned about them versus this person who's self-isolating because of travel, but that travel really posed minimal risk. So we are just, just we have to ask questions. We need to do this risk assessment because we don't have the flow chart that says, here's what exactly you're gonna do in every situation. Uh, so I'm just gonna move the box so I can see this one. What about isolation for members of uh, households who have traveled? Now this is an interesting one. We were just talking about this before the meeting because I think where this is gonna be particularly relevant for us is gonna be with staffing. So once the borders start opening up and once people start getting towards more normal activities and travel, we're gonna people who wanna go on vacation. So what's gonna happen in December if the borders open and you have a staff member that wants to go to Florida for the week? What are we going to do in terms of restrictions coming back? Especially if Florida still has you know, a lot of cases, Florida's a bit of a hotbed. And if you take going to Florida that's already a hotbed and you're mixing people from all over North America or going there because it's warm, that person maybe is gonna be at quite high risk. So what can we do with respect to staff to go on vacation and expectations for them when they return? And I think that's something that will be a topic that, that gets to a lot of the legal aspects that, that's way out of my area to cover. That's something we need to be thinking about that we might be able to touch on in, in an upcoming town hall. But here are the things that we can think about and it's much better to do this proactively because what you don't want to do is have someone come up and say, oh, by the way, I'm going, you know, I've got vacation scheduled for next week and we're actually decided we're going to go to Florida now. So you're trying to scramble at that point, figure out what to do. And they haven't had any warning what the repercussions might be. We can do it now saying here are the different options we might take. Uh, and we know what the, you know, the legalities and all those other issues are. But hopefully we'll get someone that knows a lot more about the law than I do to talk about that. Now, from an Ontario standpoint, um, when the information came out about opening up services beyond the urgent care, the comment was veterinary services can resume all services by appointment. Uh, and this brings in just the question of control of clinic access, right? If you think about your waiting room, and we think about wanting to restrict people as we start opening waiting rooms up in the future, and we think about the number of people we can get in there, which is going to be fairly small, we need to think about how people come. And, you know, will you take walk-ins? Will you take people that can just show up and get food? Or is everything going to be scheduled by appointment only? Um, so that we can control the number. Like, it doesn't make sense to have, you know, no one at the front desk, you know, for much of the day, and all of a sudden you've got five people hanging around jostling for space. It creates risk uh, for them. Uh, and again, that's going to be something that people are going to be wary of. As, as this still evolves, there is going to be this sensitivity of being in close confines with other close confines with other people. So the more we can make clients, you know, happy from their risk standpoint, the better. So the more we can control how people come in and when they come in, so that we don't get a bunch of people coming at the same time, I think that's going to be better for us at various levels. Um, as we, as we return to elective procedures, what risk do you think there is doing a dental? Uh, dentals are a great topic. So I did a blog post on that a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, traditionally I've always said that, you know, we could do a better job with dentals, right? I'm sure vets get ocular infections from aerosolized pathogens because not everyone or not a lot of people wear eye protection, uh, which is quite different than what's done in human dentistry. Now, human dentistry, that's largely been driven by bloodborne pathogens, HIV, hepatitis viruses. Um, but, you know, we, we do have concerns just routinely from aerosolizing various things in the oral cavity of the animal. Now, where this is a really particular risk now is because of cats, right? We know cats can be infected. We don't know how often, right? And that's one of the gaps we have and we're trying to sort out. Is it, you know, 0.1% of cats from infected households or is it 20% of cats from infected households? And how many infected households are there? especially ones we don't know about because they're asymptomatic infections. So cat dentals are the big concern right now. Um, cat dentals, you know, we can't say we can't do them, but screening the health status of the owner is still a critical step. It's no guarantee, but that's the first thing is if the owner, the family has disease that might be consistent with COVID, we're better off postponing if we can. And if we can't, then we need to be able to do respiratory precautions. So in a high risk situation with an aerosol generating procedure, 
if you look at our document with the Center for Mobile, you made recently, that's where you get into the N95 mask, ideally face shield, uh, impermeable disposable gown, gloves, whole hog protection. But when we're thinking about routine dentals, like any individual might be infectious with something. So I think it's a reminder of thinking about mask, thinking about eye protection, uh, what's in that splash zone, that aerosolization zone, who's coming in and out, what are we contaminating, how do we clean and disinfect. So I think it's a good time to be revisiting what we're doing with dentals, what you're doing in your clinic for your infection control practices around dentals to try to reduce the risk. We don't want people afraid to do a dental in a cat, but we just have to realize that there, there may be some increased risk. So I'm going to take a couple questions from the chat right now before we move on. So if you have other questions, feel free to toss them in. Um, what about face shields for routine use in veterinary practice? So the whole aspect of what we wear for PPE, there's no standard approach because we don't have data on it. So there are two things that we're doing when we're using PPE. One is we're protecting from the user, and that's where masks come in play, cloth masks or surgical masks. So if, if we have people wearing masks, it's to prevent them from aerosolizing and spreading droplets, so it's protecting everyone else. And if you're gonna have a mask policy in a clinic, really it should be everyone, because you know, if you have five people wearing a mask and one not, the one that's not wearing the mask is putting everyone else at risk, and they're getting the benefit from everyone else. It's not like something that's designed to protect them where you know, if they choose not to, they're just putting themselves at risk. No, they're putting others at risk. Now, face shields, eye protection are, are the opposite. So we're using those to protect us. So a face shield is something that you could say, you could, you could easily say we're gonna have masks as mandatory because we're trying to protect the population and we're trying to protect the clinic. And if you want an extra level of protection from a routine situation where you have to get close to someone, you can wear a face shield. Face shields are easy to use, they're disposable. Um, they're a personal protection item. So I think that's easier to make elective if that makes sense because people can choose whether or not they wanna take an extra level of protection for themselves. But we want a baseline level of protection for the hospital and that's where the mandatory cloth mask policy is reasonable. Um, comment below that said my staff won't wear them, makes it difficult to work and restrain. So it depends if you're talking about face shields or not. But one thing to remember is like, if, you're, if you have a reason from an infection control standpoint to wear something, make them wear it. It's your job, you have to do it. If you don't, it's a labor, it's an occupational health issue. So there are two, th two sides that come into this. So you do have to, to lay down the law a little bit. If you decide that you want to have mask policy in the clinic, that's because you're trying to protect everyone in the clinic. If someone doesn't want to wear a mask in the clinic, they're doing something that's putting others at risk. And that's a, that's a ministry of labor issue. That's an occupational health issue. Now, if they don't want to wear a face shield for close contacts, and I think that's probably their own decision, right? If they don't think it, it's cost benefit, if they think, okay, the other procedures we're doing are low risk, and the person, people are healthy and they're doing a good job of reporting issues and I'm otherwise low risk for complications, I'm not going to bother wearing a face shield because I can accept that small degree of risk and I don't like the hassles that face shields bring in. Okay, that's okay. But if you have a situation where we have a face shield as a recommendation because it's a high risk situation. So we've got an animal coming from a positive household and we're doing an aerosol generating procedure on it. And it's a cat in particular then our policy is gonna be you wear a face shield and a mask and other things. And if someone says, no, I don't wanna wear a face shield, then my response would be, okay, well, no, you're not doing the procedure because that's you know, dictated, it's a recommendation from us, you know, it's, it's the CDC table recommendation and everything else. You're starting to breach a standard expectation. So you've got things that are baseline expectations to protect the population, we can mandate those. You've got things that are standard procedures that are you know, reasonable and fairly widely disseminated, we should mandate those. And we've got things we can add on that people could use for their extra level of protection. It's just like, you know, pre-COVID, we'd say, we're not gonna recommend you wear gloves for every physical exam. If, you, if you're really worried about something and you wanna wear gloves, go for it. But we're not gonna mandate it because the cost benefit's not there, but we're not going to prevent you from taking a practical measure, a cheap, effective measure, maybe effective measure. Um, so it does take some discussions with staff, but it's important for people to realize what the PPE is meant to do and who they're trying to protect with it. Um, have a risk assessment, including age, decide who has the most access. And I'm not sure if that means the PPE. Uh, do people under 30 need the same restrictions as older people? So if this is related to PPE, it comes back to the same concept before. It's why are we using the PPE? So if it's a cloth mask or a surgical mask, and we're, we're using that to prevent dissemination, then that's in everyone, right? Under 30, you're less likely to get severely ill. It doesn't mean you're less likely to get infected. So if we're doing something to prevent that person from infecting others, 
everyone should have it. So here's where you say, okay, the mask policy will be for everyone because everyone could be infected or protecting everyone. The face shield can be an add-on if you're worried about it. And that's particularly useful if you're old, if you're diabetic, if you have underlying respiratory disease. So again, it's thinking about is that protecting you or protecting others and thinking about your access, how much material you have, like how much PP you have and do you need to conserve or alter some practices? Uh, I guess just keep going a couple more questions. Melanie, jump in if you've got any you want to get, uh, get on. I've got some other ones on my slides, but uh, uh, next. There's, there's one there about public transport versus um, carpooling and biking to work yeah. in urban centers. Yeah, that's right, I was just going next. Okay, so uh, should clinics in large urban centers encourage carpooling or biking to work versus using public transport? You know, that's, that's a tough question, right? Because it depends on how you can safely get there. And, you know, there are certainly issues with everyone trying to drive into work, like biking. The, the big thing is like this virus, if we're focusing just on this virus, the big risk periods are when you're inside in close proximity, someone in enclosed spaces and you have more people and you have less distancing. And, you know, that describes a bus quite effectively. So public transport is inherently going to be higher risk than using your car. Uh, biking or walking to work is going to be very low risk. Outdoor transmission, transitly walking by someone is going to be exceptionally low risk. You know, there are other reasons to use public transport. So it comes down to the cost benefit. It comes down to knowing the epidemiology in your area. So I, I don't think anyone's got a really good answer to that. From a disease standpoint, though, the more you can stay distance, the better. So from, yeah, strictly from a disease standpoint, less public transport would be good, but is that good in the grand scheme of things? There'll probably be a lot of debate over that. Um, there's a comment, I think the potential workers comp issue, if they don't I think that would relate to people who are refusing to wear PPE, and absolutely, right? If they're expected to do something to protect themselves or protect others and they don't do it, then, you know, that, that brings in a few different issues. Uh, I think the last one I've got on the list here, specifically for a dental and a health, healthy cat from a home without known COVID, would you recommend goggles or face shield if these were not used before? Well, I would have recommended them to be used before. Just because we're aerosolizing, we've got our face right in that zone. You know, we're aerosolizing pastorella and stuff. It doesn't cause infections in people very often, but it can. And a face shield, goggles, we can reuse them. They're easy to use. You have to find one that works well with your face, and you have to get used to them. People don't like them at the start necessarily. But I think it should be something we should be looking at as a standard practice, because it probably will protect us from various other things. Would you mandate them or leave them to the surgeon's discretion? That's a great question. Um, since it's to protect the person, you can have more flexibility. Again, if we're doing something to protect others, we have to mandate that more. If it's something where you can do this to give yourself an added level of protection, um, you can have a little more flexibility, although I think it's really hard to argue that you don't need eye protection for dental, even though it's not something we've done very well historically. We're aerosolizing bacteria and we have our face right there. Uh, we don't have any data that would show that it causes a problem, but you know, plausibly, Think we have abundant reason to think it would be. So uh, it's a pretty wishy-washy answer, but my recommendation would be to use eye protection in, in dentals full stop. So I think that might be it for that round of questions. Uh, got a couple more, I've got a few more minutes, I guess. Uh, okay, this is a longer one. I've not seen recommendations on how to monitor staff on a daily basis. So again, keeping the virus out of your clinic is key. As we start to bring more people in, you know, we have other risks, but the big risks are going to be our personnel because we have the closest contact with them, most prolonged contact and contact where we probably use the weaker, weakest barriers. So getting to the question, so we consider ourselves it's clear and attempting to prevent spread for clinics, but staff return to work daily. Uh, with the risk they've been infected. Yeah, there's always some risk and with asymptomatic infections that makes it more complicated. Do we need to wear masks at work at all times? It's not unreasonable. Well, it, you don't need to wear a mask if you're by yourself, right? We're worried about that six foot distance. We're not worried about you being in a room without a mask and aerosolizing something and someone walks in five minutes later in the air and the, the virus is still in the air. That We're worried about droplets and that close contact. So. An advantage of saying you wear a mask all the time in the clinic is you've got it on when you turn the corner and someone's right in your face you didn't know was going to be there. Uh, so it depends on your clinic, the number of people, how you're laid out. But if you can be confident you're not going to be within six feet of someone, you don't need a mask. If you, if you can't, then having a cloth mask is good. Um, they're not the comfortable, most comfortable thing to wear all day, so it's nice to have situations where you can get it off. But if you're going to have a chance to be in close contact, a mask is a good idea. 
what do you do with the lunchroom? And that's where you think about occupancy and that's where you think about space. Like you can eat lunch six feet away from someone and the risk is going to be negligible. So how do we space out lunches? How much time do you have there again? What's the maximum occupancy of the room? How do you prevent spread between staff? Well, it's hygiene, it's wearing a mask, it's making sure staff are healthy, uh, making sure people don't try to suck it up and come to work if they're not feeling well. And this can get abused, but I think we have to accept that we're gonna take some risk of people being liberal with stay home with your sick policies. Because I think I said this last time, there are multiple clinics in Canada that are shut down because of this virus because someone brought it in and spread it to other people. So we can do things to reduce the risk, wearing a mask, all the distancing to reduce the risk. But if we've got an infected person in there, we're not going to completely eliminate that risk. So keeping sick people out is really critical. Uh, I cannot imagine we can maintain distance at work. So an asymptomatic staff member spreading the virus is a concern. Uh, absolutely. How do we monitor our staff? And it really, it's up to them. So it's up to them to do that syndromic monitoring. If they're not feeling well, there are some online checklists you can go through that will tell you whether COVID is likely or not. Uh, as testing becomes more available, that's going to help us a lot because we're getting to the point in a lot of provinces where if you have clinical signs that might be related at all, you can get fairly easy testing. It depends where you are in your health unit. But if people can stay home and if they can get a test and if turnaround times on tests are good, then we're talking a couple days as opposed to two weeks. So again, thinking about staffing implications, we can't forget that, but the implications of getting this virus in the clinic are pretty high. So we have to have people being aware if they've been exposed and aware if they've been sick and taking precautions because of that. Uh, physical distancing in the exam room, is it feasible? Well, no, not really. Like if you're trying to figure out, well, what, what creates risk? Close, close spaces, not a lot of ventilation, not being able to stay more than six feet away from someone and talking, right? That describes most of our exam rooms. So we can't physically distance very well. We can do a bit. We can have the owners back at the side while we're working the animals. So we, we can keep ourselves, you know, more than a meter apart, but less than two meters apart. And that's going to help. If you look at some European countries, they're saying one meter as opposed to two meters as they're scaling things back. So we can do some physical distancing, but we can't rely on that completely. So there has to be some other way to do that. And one is, you know, just not, not letting people in the exam room. It's probably the best thing. But if they have to have them in the exam room, then we start thinking about masks. And also thinking about making sure that the owners are healthy. So the, the pre-visit or the upon arrival questionnaire to make sure that they're not sick haven't been exposed to someone that's sick. Um, you can ask people to wear a mask. Again, a mask is to protect you from them. So you can ask that, that's perfectly fair. And you know, since most people or a lot of people are gonna have masks in the next little bit, you could ask them to bring their mask and you can always give them a mask if you're concerned about that. You wear a mask, they wear a mask, you distance yourself as much as possible, you minimize the time in that room. If you need to do something where, you're, where the client would restrain, the idea we don't have the client restrain, we take the animal out of the room, have staff restrain and go back in. So just all these basic things to reduce contact. Uh, the next one's kind of less relevant now in Ontario since we're moving beyond urgent care, but how do you explain to my clients my decisions when they compare to other practices that have decided not to slow their business? And that's tough, right? You kind of want to throw them under the bus, but you really shouldn't. Um, and basically, I think it's an explaining, well, we've got direction that was given to us by the government to protect you and to protect us. And we've got direction given to us by our our regulatory body, uh, you know, our, my dentist, orthodontist, they sent an email basically, you know, saying as the regulatory body says, we can and can't do these things because we're protecting ourselves, we're protecting our, our patients, and we're conserving supplies for the medical sector where they're needed. I think that talking point is, is still very fair. Like we're doing what we've been asked to help protect the public, which means we're protecting you, but also making sure we can do the critical things. And it's inconvenient, but we have to do this um, and then you let the clients interpret that as they will. Oops, I moved ahead. Um, how will host call medicine? I, I did a blog post on that before. I think host call medicine is very similar. I've got a slide that probably won't get to, but it's, again, it's thinking about distancing. It's thinking about the health status of who's there. It's thinking about if you're having someone from the house handle, pick the lowest risk person, person that's not sick person that's not exposed, maybe the person's recovered from it because the household has had, had infection. That's kind of a broader topic we can get to later on potentially or I can follow up after. Testing, we talked about testing the first time. Um, there are PCR tests available, as you know. Um, 
are they validated? Yes. Do we have a lot of information on the validation? Not really. Most of the diagnostic labs, they, they keep their validation information proprietary. So we kind of have big picture uh, information on what they do. And you know, if you look at IDEX, they reported that they tested a few thousand dogs and cats and some other species, and they were all negative in their initial testing. And that was basically just to show the test was specific because there, were, there weren't any of those animals, there weren't many or any that were known to be exposed to a COVID person, so they weren't kind of likely to be infected. But the fact that there were that many negatives show there's not cross-reaction. So I think I've got, I have good confidence in the specificity of the tests, so not getting false positives. Don't know as much about the sensitivity, so how good it is at picking it up. And that also is dependent on how good we swab. And it's dependent on the dynamics of the virus and the animal and things that we don't really understand. So I think our, our good commercial labs, um, I have quite good confidence in, in their assays, even though the validation information isn't all that clear because they tend to do a very good job with quality control. And I think specificity is fine, although sensitivity, I, I think we still need to sort out. And the only way we're going to sort that out is by finding cases, obviously. You can't sort out sensitivity how well it picks up a positive. We don't have many positives. Uh, yeah, maybe jump back to some questions here, see if there are any other ones that come up. Um, can you have a mask and on at all times in the clinic to prevent contamination of keyboards and phones? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, would it reduce the risk a little bit? Maybe. Um, the environment's not thought to be a major source. Like if the environment was a major source, social distancing wasn't, wouldn't work as well. So if you're going to the grocery store and people were contaminating all the surfaces and foods and door handles and everything else, we would have more spread and we'd have more undefined spread, just like if this was an airborne virus. So everything points to this being direct contact and droplets. And yeah, if you wear a mask, you're gonna, you're gonna reduce that. You're gonna reduce the environmental contamination. Is it gonna have a big impact overall? It's hard to say. And this is another reason why we just talk about hand hygiene as being an important thing. Washing your hands, using a hand sanitizer regularly so you can pick up things that you might have inadvertently been exposed to. It, it's cost benefit, right? Um, you know, from a prevention of droplet standpoint, wearing a mask all the time is ideal. From a live your life, standpoint uh it's not and wearing a mask that gets wet you know wet um you know can create some problems to it itself in terms of its efficacy and some other complications so i i'd have a harder time saying you have to have a mask on at all times in any general environment area if there's no one else around it's going to have some degree of protection so it really depends on how risk averse you are but i would focus on the high risk areas compliance in those areas and good hand washing um even if a staff member or their spouse tests negative, Public Health Ontario still mandates a two-week self-isolation period. So in terms of testing, yeah. So there, because the test tells you what the result is right now, maybe. All right. So if you've got an animal, so it doesn't matter if it's a person animal. So let's say you've got a, a cat we're worried about. And this is why testing isn't something we use for infection control purposes. So let's say we've got a cat that comes into your clinic and it's from a COVID positive household. So you say, okay, we're gonna isolate it. We're gonna wear lots of PPE but I don't want to use my isolation or I don't want to keep it there because it's not very good for patient care. Or I don't want to burn through all that PPE. So I'm going to test this cat. Well, a positive is a positive. Uh, a negative tells you they didn't find anything on that sample. So maybe it was negative. Maybe your sample was crappy. Maybe there wasn't a lot of virus there. Maybe it was exposed and it wasn't shedding at that point, but it's, it's shedding now, right? It might not have been shedding at the time you got the sample, but maybe an hour later it started shedding. And that's why that relates to that question is a negative result can speed up your window. Sometimes if you look at healthcare workers, they would typically speed up the self-isolation period with two negative samples, negative PCR samples, because it's important to get them back to work as quick as possible. Um, if it's a situation where self-isolation isn't as disruptive, then it's easier to say, okay, 14 days, doesn't really matter what the result is. A positive tells you for sure, a negative tells you maybe. So, um, that probably relates back to this, this sensitivity of PCR question. I think we're probably about out of time. Do you want me to take another one? Yeah, it's the top of the hour. I don't see any last um, questions in the chat box. Um, so are you okay to wrap up or do yeah, you- that's great. We've got other questions we can use next time if we're still going. So uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Again, if there are questions, feel free to let us know other questions we can hit next time. We wanna to know topics you wanna to know about, right? We don't waste everyone's time. So. If there are areas you think we should cover 
people that should be brought in to talk about things, uh, please suggest those as well as just general questions that we can get to. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you, Scott. And thank you for everyone for today's town hall and please join us next week. And lastly, thanks again to Hills Pet Nutrition for sponsoring this series. Have a good day, everyone. Great. Thanks.